that's a water is a big issue uh, surrounding all of our communities and especially here in Newark, um, which does get its water from uh, up in northern New Jersey where where we are. We where the Turtle Clan, as you may have seen downstairs in the uh, display, has been suffering for 50 years uh, because of illegal dumping that occurred. Uh, that was encouraged by the town and even um, permitted by the state of New Jersey. And when I say that it was dumped on us, I mean literally. It was in our yards, on the streets, where we uh, would go and collect our wild vegetables and our wild fruits. It's where we would go rabbit hunting and bird hunting and fishing. And all of those things we had no concept because they didn't affect us immediately. And over time, what happened was we had people that started to get coughing and skin rashes and then all of a sudden diabetes came out of nowhere like a, it was rampant. Um, blood pressure, uh, eye problems, cancers started to show up. We had one street where there's 18 homes and out of 18 homes there's been over 40 something deaths in cancer alone. <coughs> Ten year old boy Colin had two rare cancers uh, up his spine, died in his uncle's arms. Uh, last year, we lost a 30-year-old grandma turtle plant mother of three children, uh, the youngest being less than a year. So this is something that um, continues to plague us, and I am uh, utterly honored um, to be able to be a part of this uh, program um, that really has set the tone, um, being that this is really where the United States began. This is where all the industry came. Patterson, Gore, uh, the Rimapo Mountains. Um, so, while you're all here, um, <laughs> that's my cue. <laughs> I was looking for you out there going like this. Um, anyway, in our culture, we have no word for time. Um, but in the mayor's world, uh, he probably does. Even though he probably would like to sit here and hang out with us all day, he does have important things to do. And uh, again, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Chief Man. So I, uh, my name is Liz Shevchenko, I'm Director of the Humanities Action Lab. A lot of you know me, but many of you I'm meeting for the first time. And I asked the leaders of the land of the city and of our campus to come and give a special welcome to you and make sure you all from wherever you're coming from, Newark or elsewhere, knew um, how important it is and how valuable it is for us to host you and welcome you here in Newark. So before they do that, I wanted to, we tried a little bit of this last night, but for their sake, um, to tell them where uh, everybody is coming from and recognize that. And I'm just noticing that everybody's got good table surface here. So last night we did it with our hands clapping. And then today I think we should try drumming on the tables. We had a great drum performance last night. So the people in this room are coming. Uh, who's here from Newark or New Jersey? Just drum on the table real loud. All right. And then what if you're from Albany? People from Albany, keep on drumming, keep on drumming. Is it going to be silent, Albany people? And we have people from Bogota, Colombia, you can keep drumming. Chicago, this whole table is loud. Greensboro, North Carolina. Indianapolis. My abuelas, Puerto Rico, do they come? Do they make it? All right, play a ride. Good, they just flew in like just now. Mexico City, all the way to Mexico City. From Miami, from Milwaukee. personally with uh, your work to recover the histories and honor the histories of your local communities in order to project visions for the future. Um, the mayor, uh, Raz Baraka's vision has been described as futurist, which I really love. <laughs> um, he's a native of Newark, a son of noted playwright Amiri Baraka and poet Amina Baraka. And so his family has actually lived in the city yeah, for over 70 years. Um, which is something he's always honored. And so uh, 
He also, uh, like many of you, is an educator. Prior to um, his political career, he worked as an English and history, which we're very excited about, teacher, for the Newark Public Schools. Um, and in 2015, he was named most valuable mayor on the nation's most valuable progressives list. Um, his BA is in political science from Howard. We always use years here. I like to not do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we'll do it for me too. And his MA in education supervision from St. Peter's University in Jersey City. Um, his futurist agenda includes implementation of a groundbreaking partnership called Hire by Live Newark which is a program that marks the first time that any U.S. city has sought to transform its economy by combining employment, procurement, and residential strategies. He is considered um, by uh, me and many other uh, people a thought leader nationally in the space of urban revitalization, and his defiance of a hostile presidential directive targeting the immigrant community with an executive order designating Newark as a sanctuary city solidified his status in one of the Please join me in welcoming Mayor Ross Baraka. Good morning. Glad to have you here. Because uh, it'd be raining outside. <laughs> and then all of this, I'd like to thank the Humanities Actions Lab and obviously <coughs> Rutgers University, uh, our uh, president, our, our, our great person over there, Nancy Cantor. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you who came from many, many places to Newark, New Jersey to talk about climate inequality. Uh, inequality to me is a bunch of different things, right? It, it, when we start talking about inequality and the climate, it, we, I think of many things other than just land, air, water, uh, you know, housing. I think of all kind of things because, especially when uh, the chief here asked us to say thank you in our own language, I got, I got kind of confused <laughs> because, I mean, I'm many different people, as my mother would say, and I got a lot of people in me. And, uh, you know, one of them is African, and we speak a lot of different languages, and God knows I don't know which country in Africa I came from, so I can't speak to you in my original language. But uh, that being said, uh, I want to say thank you in English, uh, uh, you know, just to let you know who I am here in the city of Newark. There are a lot of things that we're trying to do. Uh, you know, our people in this community have been plagued by many different environmental issues uh, since the beginning of us migrating and immigrating to this city. Uh, the, the industry, the growth, the development, the old infrastructure, all the other things that have been neglected and not changed and not invested in has affected us for generations and generations and generations, particularly uh, people of color in these communities who don't have the ability to move or to, to, to change where they live, or just get up and walk away and go somewhere else. They have to uh, deal with what's happening in these communities. And so it's incumbent upon us to go further than just a discussion about it. A lot of times we have a discussion. Sometimes we even go further than that and we protest. But even, bef even further than that, we have to begin to envision and think about building, and that's the harder part. How do you build a place that we all can live in? And that takes a different set of emotions a different set of intelligence, a different set of commitment, not to just uh, be angry at the way things are, but to actually create a place that's different than the way things are. And that takes a lot of different people. It takes engineers, mathematicians, scientists, teachers, social workers. It takes all of us together to figure out how to develop a place. It's not enough to be on TV debating about uh, you know, whether we should have money for infrastructure or whether health care should be free. We actually need people to think about how to make it free. We need people to develop structures to make it easier for us to change infrastructure here, to not fight each other about things that we knew were a problem for 50 years. Mm -hmm. right? And we have not had the wherewithal or the sense or the will or uh, you know, just put our minds together collectively to figure out how to wrestle the real problems. Because quietly is kept, Donald Trump is a distraction. Yes. Yeah. He's not even the real problem. Mm -hmm. He is uh, the, the iceberg, uh, the tip of an iceberg that is distracting us from solving real problems. He's the obstacle in the way of many of us trying to wrestle with these yeah. problems. So we have to move them aside and, and, and get together and that, that you know, moving them aside is a difficult task. I don't make it seem as easy. 
we have to move them aside, but then we have to get about the business of trying to create and develop a world that's safer, that's more equal, uh, that's equitable, that's fair, that's just, uh, and it is pleasant for all of us to live in together, to cohabitate, because yeah. we don't have any other, op any other choice. There is no shuttles to Saturn or Mars. <laughs> We're here on this planet, and our job is to sustain it as long as we possibly can for our children and for my, for my newborn son, uh, Jua Yamache, Imamu Kofi, Baraka. I have to make sure that the planet is safer for him than it was for me. God bless. Enjoy the conference.
Of course, perhaps it goes without saying, and my wonderful mayor said it a bit, that we all need spirit lifting and active camaraderie in light of the divisive state of our national and global polity, our discourse, our social, political, economic landscape. We need spirit lifting. And there's nothing that lifts our spirit more than being connected to the origins of land. And thank you for the amazing work you have done and continue to do as house stalwarts. And we so look forward to following this latest amazing exhibit as it travels to your local communities and as our Honors Living Learning Community students partner with your teams as well. So having noted the value of this network and its reach, as we heard drummed earlier, let me turn a moment to the local and the place we're in here at this moment. So I hope you'll forgive my cheerleading, but Newark is a very special place and time right now. You heard a bit from our extraordinary civic leader, <coughs> artist, as Liz said, educator, activist, deeply of the place, but also in the movement more broadly. We also have an incredibly strong network of homegrown cultural and community-based partners, activists, educational institutions that are anchors, even corporate institutions that are anchors. And we're all trying, messy as the work is, to create equitable growth and spread democratic practice. In this context, Rutgers Newark is deeply committed to being an anchor institution, not just haphazardly in Newark, but of Newark. We strive to help to cultivate the next generation of change agents, including a substantial commitment to those for whom this city is home. And likewise, the next generation of publicly engaged scholars and collaborative scholarship and community-based work. We see our anchor work as acts of co-creation with our home community across a range of arenas that address long-standing <coughs> and ever escalating racialized inequality. The sequela you see everywhere in this land, and definitely here, is an architecture, physical, social, economic, educational, of segregation. That is a legacy we don't want the seventh generation yet to come to inherit. So HAL and its third iteration of its collective projects, Climates of Inequality, Stories of Environmental Justice, following the really, truly impactful Guantanamo Public Memory Project and the States of Incarceration. Climates of Inequality epitomizes, in my view, the best of what it means to do good, honest, place-based collaborative anchor work that resonates both locally and globally. And I'm gonna come back to that theme constantly. People are often say to me, and maybe they do to you, why are you so local? Why are you so parochial? Especially academics, academics love to not care at all about local and be right, networked, right, across some disciplinary network or some hierarchical elite, right? What I want us to prove is that you only do global work well if you are embedded and know your local narrative. And I think that's what you all have shown. So now, from my perspective, 
active, enshrines active art in the public humanities as a catalyst, a catalytic change agent in three critical ways. First, it's a catalyst, catalyst for institutional transformation in how we educate and how we produce scholarship and how we engage with community partners. So never think that the HAL network we are supporting is simply about out there. It's about in here, too. We don't change out there till we change in here. Second, it galvanizes community transformation collaboratively emphasize, repeat, 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 collaboratively addressing pressing social issues with frontline community partners. And third, but third, it spreads national and global public consciousness of injustice that honors the local while energizing a broader movement. It's those three pillars of your work, and of course they're all intertwined, that are so critical in my mind. And in this tradition, Newark, New Jersey joins its sister cities around the globe. It's a frontline community, ground zero to the architecture of segregation in all of its history and durable impact. But as importantly, it's also emblematic as a place of the people's resistance to injustice and resilience in making change. And as a small aside, and I will get through these, my dear friend the mayor has a wonderful way when people, usually <coughs> white people no longer here, say, the Newark riots, he says. No, riots are when college students burn cars when they win a football game. <laughs> Rebellion is when the people resist yeah. injustice. Newark is a place that comes honestly by that resistance. The movement in Newark is led in no small part. It is not coincidental that he's an artist and comes from a family of artists. It is led in no small part by the intertwining of its artists, <coughs> its leadership, and its network of community-based organizations. All of them swimming together to tell stories, uncover racist legacies, and make change. So this is what I call, and perhaps the rain is a sign of this, this is what I call a good, perfect storm of expertise and commitment, of people and place, of history and history making. And the sun will shine when that comes together. Moving forward and moving across this HAL national and global network of frontline communities, and at the risk of a bit of repetition, I want to highlight here the pieces or facets of what I believe to be key to effective anchor institution collaborations in frontline communities. In this regard, I see this from four perspectives on this question. From communities, from universities, from the public good, and from the movement. <coughs> and I see how, and this amazing climates of inequality work as exemplary in all four of those regards. So very quickly, from the perspective of frontline communities, the work needs to be authentic. You all have your own way of what conveys, construes authenticity. For me, it comes first and foremost from being deeply place-based 
and yet broadly collaborative in the way different lenses on the place are given voice. Right? The different ways we have narratives that unpack the place, but yet we have shared goals of authenticity and honesty, especially with respect to racialized immigration, migration, destruction of land, and the creation of something better going forward. And I need not tell you, and I though I will, <laughs> that there's no question that climates of inequality with your amazing authentic voices. Voices, 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 not one. Not one elite lens, not one cult of the expert, but all the voices models this aspect perfectly. <coughs> now from the perspective of universities, and here I repeat myself, but I cannot say it enough times, and everyone who knows me knows I say it all the time. This work is as much about changing what our institutions are like as it is about a movement for equitable growth in communities. They're completely interdependent. Something else that online has taught me deeply. No good work is done alone. But what that means is just as you open up the land that has been ruined, the history that has such destruction built in it, we have to also, those of us from universities, look within our institutions at change we need to make, for example, in how we holistically need to operate doing research as publicly engaged scholarship, teaching as cultivating inclusive talent, and engagement as co-creation and collaboration beyond ourselves. Until we do all of that together as an institutional, in terms of our practice, we won't be good co-creators or partners. And we won't be honest and authentic beyond. And then from the perspective of the public good, for this work to be successful, we need to learn to co-create. I see Anne Englert over there. We talk about co-creation in third spaces. Express Newark that you are in is the third space of co-creation for many of us. We need to eschew the boundaries of university and community. I have only recently begun to hear from lots of different collaborative enterprises how universities need new language for co-creation. Because we're so busy saying, university community collaboration as if those are two different spheres, two different lands, two different worlds. For too long, they have been two different worlds. But to do co-creation in third spaces requires a lot of hard, messy work as I know you know from climates of inequality. It's a true education in bridging divides, exposing history, and taking the considerable challenges of our democracy series. And I will end one more. Finally, from the perspective of an activist movement, this work, as I said, needs to be birthed and defined and embedded locally. And then we watch the ripple effects of narrative making, of co-creation, of the exposition of injustice resonate globally. You will see that 
as this goes to the 20 participating frontline communities. And there will be more. States of Incarceration already has up to 30 communities participate. It'll create what Liz calls, and I quote, an international memory movement. I love that idea. A memory movement. Telling stories. Never underestimate the power of telling stories. Touching multiple publics and arousing consciousness. Arouse consciousness. And when you do it, do it with a racial equity lens and define race in the broadest of senses in which it has manifested itself over generation after generation. So in sum, I simply want to thank everyone involved in how for demonstrating to us all that it's possible to learn and to care at the same time. Thank you.